I want to read Luke 2. I'm going to start with the Christmas story. Luke 2, starting in verse 1. At the time, at that time, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria. All returned to their own ancestral towns to register for the, for the census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, to whom he was engaged, who was now expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. We, we come today to celebrate that very thing. We, we're celebrating the birth of our Savior. We, we're rejoicing that He was willing, like Andrew said, He's willing to leave the untold joys of heaven to, to reside with us for a little while, to take on flesh this tent that He lived in so that He could do more than that, more than just be here. More, He, he humbled Himself to come, but the Creator becoming the created, but it was more than that. He grew as a man. And he, and, he, and he wasn't heralded with trumpets, but rather he came as a helpless baby and he, and, he, and he lived like us. He didn't come to stand at arm's length away from us. He, he didn't come to have servants serving him, meeting his every need. He came to experience all that we experience. He lived in the struggle. He lived with the temptations. He lived through the trials and he overcame them all. And he served us. And he didn't ask for us to bring him gifts, although some did bring him gifts. But instead, he came to offer himself as a gift, as a sacrifice for all of us so that we could truly experience life through him. That's what we celebrate this morning. Philip Yancey describes it like this in The Jesus I Never Knew. He says, contrast the humility that characterizes Jesus' royal visit to planet Earth with the prestigious image associated with world rulers today. He said in London, looking toward the auditorium's royal box where the queen and her family sat, I caught glimpses of the way rulers stride through the world with bodyguards and a trumpet fanfare and a flourish of bright clothes and flashing jewelry. He said when Queen Elizabeth II came to visit the United States, uh, and reporters delighted in spelling out all the logistics that were involved, which included her 4,000 pounds of luggage, including two outfits for every single occasion, an outfit for mourning in case someone died, 40 pints of plasma, and white kid leather toilet seat covers. She brought along her own hairdresser. She brought along two valets and a host of other attendants. And this brief visit of royalty easily cost $20 million. He said, in meek contrast, God's visit to earth took place in an animal shelter with no attendants present and nowhere to lay the newborn baby except for a feeding trough. Indeed, the event that divided history and even divides our calendars into two parts may have more animals that witnessed it than humans. And he ends with this. He says, a mule could have stepped on him. That's the Jesus who came. The humility of, on display in the manger. Think of the depth of love that is being communicated that, that is being displayed in that event uh, of creator becoming created and not just created, but humbly coming as, as a baby, as a baby, helpless, born to loving parents, but parents nonetheless of meager circumstances. First, his birth first announced to shepherds, which would have been seen as the scoundrels of their society, and then had to be placed in a feeding trough. His birth we celebrate today. 
But it's not just his birth that we're celebrating. That's just where the celebration begins. We, we're celebrating Jesus' life and his display of God's love as well. And beyond that, we're celebrating Jesus' death on a cross. And we're celebrating Jesus' resurrection from the grave. And we celebrate that this morning, but there's still more that we celebrate. We also celebrate what is recorded in Isaiah chapter 40, verses 9 through 11. It says, O Zion, messenger of good news, shout from the mountaintops. Shout it louder, O Jerusalem. Shout and do not be afraid. Tell the towns of Judah, your God is coming. Yes, the sovereign Lord is coming in power. He will rule with a powerful arm. See, he will bring his reward with him as he comes. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will carry the lambs in his arms, holding them close to his heart. He will gently lead the mother sheep with their young. Yes, Jesus came and was born in a manger, and we celebrate that. But we also celebrate that he is coming again. We remember his birth. We celebrate his death and his resurrection, but we need to also celebrate that he is going to return. And when he returns, it will not be in humility, but it will be with power. He will not be helpless, but he will be the only one who could help us. Jesus is the greatest gift ever. And he is a gift that keeps on giving, not just through this lifetime, but throughout all eternity. And so that's what I want to look at this morning. I want to look at the fact that Jesus brings us gifts that continue to give for our lifetime and beyond. So let's look at what it says in Isaiah 40. It tells us that he comes in power, which means, which equals that we ought to be living in confidence. If our Jesus comes in power, the second coming reigns in power, lives with power, then we ought to be confident. When we recognize the Savior is all-powerful, when we recognize that he is the victor over death and over sin, when we recognize that he will make everything right and put everything in its proper place, when we realize that he is the one and only God, we should live with bold confidence. Let me ask you, are you tired of living in fear? Are you tired of struggling with worry? Are you tired of feeling overwhelmed in a world that seems to be embracing chaos instead of truth? Then surrender to the all-powerful Lord. Surrender to Jesus. At the end of Hebrews chapter 10, it says this. It says, for, just, for in just a little while, the coming, the coming one will come and not delay, and my righteous ones will live by faith. But I will take no pleasure in anyone who turns away. Now, what this is what it says. But we are not like those who turn away from God to their own destruction. We are the faithful ones whose souls will be saved. This, this text reminds us Jesus is coming again, and, and we need to live faithfully, emboldened, inspired, ignited on fire for him. Psalm 56 says this I praise God for what he has promised, I trust in God. So why should I be afraid? What can mere mortals do to me? What can mere mortals do to you and to me? I heard a story, an Arab chief tells a story of a spy who was captured and sentenced to death by a general in the Persian army. Now this general had this very unique custom. He would give all those condemned criminals a choice they could take the firing squad or they could have the big black door. As the moments for his execution came near, the spy was brought before this Persian general. And the general asked him the question, what will it be, the firing squad or the big black door? The spy hesitated for a long time. It's a pretty difficult decision. And he finally made his choice. I choose the firing squad. Moments later, shots rang out, confirming his execution. The general turned to his aide and he said, they always prefer the known way to the unknown. It is a characteristic of people 
to be afraid of the undefined, yet we gave him a choice. The aide asked the general, well, what lies behind the big black door? Freedom, replied the general. I've, only, I've known only a few brave enough to take it. Freedom. Let me ask you a question. We celebrate Jesus' birth, which we recognize led to him growing and living a perfect life, serving us in all sorts of ways, dying on the cross as a sacrifice for our sin, raising from the grave to be victorious over death, and going back to be with the Father until he returns to, to take, it all, take us all back, to bring us all back with him. Are we brave enough to live in that unseen certainty? Are we brave enough to live in that unseen certainty? Hebrews 11 describes faith like this. Faith is the confidence that we that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about things we cannot see. The very definition of faith is that we will live knowing for certain what we cannot see with our eyes, that Jesus is coming again, that Jesus did raise from the dead, that Jesus has made a way for us. He is coming in power, which means you and I should be living in power. Is that the life you live? That's a gift Jesus gave you. Have you opened it? And are you using it today? That's the first gift. The second one is that he comes as a shepherd, which equals for us, that we should know he will provide for us. You know, think about that. Jesus comes as the shepherd, meaning that he cares for us, meaning that he will even carry us when he needs to. And it isn't just what he will do, it's what he is doing. It's not just what he is going to accomplish at the end, it's, it's what he's doing today. Jesus is a good shepherd who who loves his sheep enough to lay down his life for them, who, who leads us into the green pastures and the still waters, who, who tends to our every single hurt, who, who leaves the 99 behind to find us when we stray. That's what Jesus does. That's who Jesus is. In John 10, Jesus describes himself like this. He says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep and they know me. Just as my Father knows me and I know the Father, so I sacrifice my life for the sheep. Jesus is the good shepherd who lays down his life so that you and I can have life because we are his and he is ours. There was an uprising in the Middle East. Ron and Joke Jones, who served with the Christian and Missionary Alliance in Israel, communicated the following in a letter. They said the result of the fighting and killing has left a profound sense of discouragement that hovers over the country. Several times we have come into closer contact with this conflict than our comfort zone allowed. Yesterday, a friend shared with us something she observed that was a delightful reminder of God's care for us. She watched a shepherd caring for his flock near the area where guns were being fired. And every time a shot rang out, the sheep scattered in fright. The shepherd then touched them each with his staff and spoke calmly to them. The sheep settled back down immediately because they trusted the shepherd. And then another shot sounded, and the same routine happened again and again. Each time the sheep needed the shepherd to orient them again and reassure them that they were safe. We are like those sheep, and our shepherd reaches out and touches us with his staff, speaking words of calm and comfort. That's you and me. We are like those sheep that Jesus speaks to us with calm and comfort. Now, no one knows the exact words. The actual shepherd was speaking to the sheep that day to calm them, but we do know at least some of the words that Jesus whispers to us in the midst of our fearful episodes in life. Words like, I will never leave you. I am always with you. Words like, I have overcome the world. Words like this, I, I, I came to bring you life, and not just any kind of life, but full life, abundant life. 
Or maybe knock and the door will be open to you. Or maybe we're reminded of Matthew 6 where Jesus says, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow for to, to, tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. Seek the kingdom and God will provide, Jesus says. You don't have to worry. I'm the good shepherd and I've got you. I'm taking care of you. I'm providing for you. See, Jesus brings us this, this, this confidence that he will provide, this knowledge that he is with us, this, this realization that no matter what comes, he, he's taking care of us. But this text also mentions one other gift. And it's not a gift that he brings us, but it's a gift that we should be bringing him. So what gift should every Christian be bringing Jesus that's the last point this morning, and it is this. Jesus is coming again, and so we should be shouting the good news. Three times in our text, it starts off with, shout the good news, shout the good news, shout the good news. This is exactly what you and I should be doing this morning. Today, our Savior was born. We ought to shout the good news. But His birthday has provided us with more gifts than just his, his coming amongst us. It, it has provided us this realization that our eternities are secure. And we should be telling others about that. A babe in the manger came. And he became a man on the cross. And he died to save us from our sins. And he gave us forgiveness. And he provides for us in eternity. In fact, in the Christmas account, when the angel is talking to Joseph, the angel says this to him. He says, Joseph... Son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And then the angel says, and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. That's the Savior we serve. That's the good news that the world needs to hear today. That's the gift that Jesus brings. And he wants us to return a gift to him, which is us proclaiming that to those around us, to those everywhere we can find. Joshua Harris shared a story. He says, I, I knew a girl who used to think the stars were tiny specks of life just over her head. I'm not kidding. And she wasn't in grade school when she believed this. She was in college. She was a really sweet, kind, redheaded redhead who spoke almost perfect Spanish. She was intelligent in many, many ways. But one day in a conversation, she mentioned that she had just learned that the stars in the night sky were actually really, really far away. I asked her what she meant. She said, you know, they're they're not just right up there. Just, they're, they're, they're not just tiny dots. They're, they're just really far away. I was incredulous. What, do you, what did you think before, I asked. Well, I thought they, they were, you know, just right above us. Now, he goes on. He says, if, if you were to ask me why it matters that we study the doctrine of God, I'd say for the same reason that it's worth knowing that stars are not just pinpricks of light just above our head. When we know the truth about God, it fills us, with, fills us with wonder. If we fail to understand His true character, we'll never be amazed by Him. We'll never feel small as we stare up at Him. We'll never worship Him as we ought. We'll never run to Him for refuge or realize the great love He's shown us in the measureless distance He bridged to rescue us. Jesus is, it, it didn't stay above us. He came and lived among us. This week I was looking at some things and I found this uh, example. It said that if the Milky Way, if you shrunk the Milky Way down to be the size of North America, so you shrunk the Milky Way down to be the size of North America, our solar system would fit in a coffee cup. That's the vastness of what God created. That's the majesty of what God provides. And too many people aren't seeing that. 
Too many people don't recognize the greatness of our God. Too many people have left Jesus in a manger. Because you know what? A baby can be controlled. A baby can be pacified. A baby can be passed on to someone else. But Jesus is no longer in a manger. He is on a throne. And he's coming back. And when he does, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. And my prayer for you and for me today is that we have already proclaimed that. And not just with our mouths, but with our lives. That he is Lord. And he is coming again. And he has brought us gifts. And we're going to tell other people about the good news of what he brings. We pray with me? God, I thank you. I thank you for Jesus. I thank you for his birth. I thank you for his willingness to come and, and live this life perfectly so that he could be the perfect sacrifice, so that he could take my sin and every other sin upon himself, becoming that sin so that we could become righteous through him. And so, Lord, I pray for each of us here that we celebrate his birth, but we recognize that his first coming it's just a reminder. It is this, this down payment, this, this uh, provision of, of security and confidence that we can proclaim he's coming again too. He came once and he's coming again. And when he comes again, it will not be as a humble baby, but it will be as the mighty Lord. And we want people to know that they can find the gifts that he brings, the hope that they need, the forgiveness through the message of our, of our Savior. Thank you, Lord, for this Christmas. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for making a way for us to be part of your family through him. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.